euh, laisser donc le président présenter notre prestigieux orateur invité étranger. Merci, effectivement. Notre prochain conférencier est le professeur George Griffin. Professor Griffin read Creating the Sciences at King's College London, where he did BSc in Pharmacology and Molecular Biology. He was awarded PhD in Cell Biology by Biochemistry, by the Chemistry, University of Perth, and returned to clinical studies at St. George's, where he was awarded the MBBS. Then Professor Griffin's postgraduate training paralleled basic and clinical science. During this time, he was awarded a Hawkins Fellowship of the Commonwealth Fund of New York at Harvard Medical School. On return to the UK, he continued clinical training at Royal Postgraduate Medical School, where he was tutor in medicine at the National Hospital for Nervous Diseases. He then returned to St. George's as a lecturer and became consultant physician on the clinical infection unit where he was instrumentally developing an internationally renowned research unit tweaked to the clinical unit. He had prestigious research fellowships at the University of Michigan and NIH. He has been chair and member of major Welcome Medical Research Council and Gates Foundation committees. He was censor at the Royal College of Physicians and was made a member of the Academy of Medical Sciences, in which he has been elected to become Foreign Secretary and Council Member. He was appointed to the Board of Public Health in England, where he will help shape strategy for research and clinical development. Si vous trouvez que tout ceci est très bien exprimé, c'est parce que je lis un texte proposé par George. It's a real pleasure to have you here for a lecture of infection and microbial microbial <coughs> resistance. Please go to the floor. Thank you very much, Pierre. Uh, I'm pleased you didn't speak all the time in French because I wouldn't have known what you were saying about it. <coughs> it it's a great honour and pleasure to be here. Uh, my role today is to set the scene for some of the detailed talks later on. Um, my work as a, a clinical infectious disease doctor uh, for 35 years in, in a unit in London uh, has really highlighted to me the incredible clinical significance now of AMR antimicrobial resistance. And it was highlighted to me some oh, five years ago when a patient, a man with an indwelling urinary catheter, um, came to see me with back pain and he had an osteomyelitis due to pseudomonas. And when we got the organism, it was totally resistant to every anti-pseudomonal agent. And this man died with bacteremia and septicemia after three months. And that, plus the tuberculosis problem of multiple drug-resistant TB and XDR-TB, uh, and now even totally resistant TB, has highlighted this, this clinical problem to me. And we've heard already the economic problems. Uh, we can see that this is not going to go away without very careful thought and planning. <clears throat> About six months ago, I was giving a talk at the Pasteur Institute in Paris. And before I went into the Pasteur, I stopped in a little cafe for a coffee. And I hate graffiti, as most of you, I'm sure, do as well. But I saw this on the wall right next door to the Pasteur Institute, and I thought, I must take a photograph of this. The greatest microbes, exclamation mark. Now, what I hope at the end of my talk, you will understand that bacteria have no brains. They are machines. They survive in incredible circumstances. 
They reproduce often within 90 minutes and they have sexual appendages, so they exchange genetic material. So with no brains and a machine, that is what our problem is. How do we combat this? Now, <clears throat> it's well recognized in, in all of the big meetings, the G8 and the G20, that infection is now not just an emerging danger, but it's a re-emerging danger with old pathogens that we thought were, were beaten. It's bacteria, it's viruses, it's fungi, and now to some extent even parasites that are gaining resistance to chemotherapy. It's the second leading cause of deaths, and I'll, I'll show you that in just a moment. It's, it's age-related, with young children and old age being particularly susceptible. And at some time, if I'm invited back, I can tell you of the research we have been doing in my unit on the aging <laughs> immune system. Uh, I won't go into that now because it will spoil it from when I come to talk. But does the immune system age? That is the fundamental question. Uh, I'll tell you about that later. And on top of that, we have this modern scourge of diabetes and of immunodeficiency, transplantation, the use of steroids. Uh, so we have a group of people who are particularly susceptible, and we have AMR behind all of that. Now, this is an old slide now. This goes back uh, to uh, 2009 in Jacobin Invest. But I show it to you because you see in the purple... <laughs> Side here, the categories of diseases which in 2009 were important killers. Now, if you look at these, diarrheal disease, still vitally important, particularly in the third world, uh, and we, we lack vaccines. And Bill Gates is making big efforts now to produce vaccines for enteric disease. But look at HIV AIDS. Now, if you have HIV AIDS, you, it's like having diabetes mellitus. You can live a, a normal lifespan and be healthy. So even in this short period, with an immense amount of research, HIV AIDS now would be a very small slice of that, thank goodness. But tuberculosis, this would now occupy that hole made by HIV. So things change, constantly change. And the TB problem, tuberculosis, is a great problem with resistance. Similarly, malaria, we thought that this was going to be beaten uh, both with vaccines and with chemotherapy. Malaria now is on the upsurge. Measles, there are deaths in Germany due to measles because of the failure of vaccine uptake. So this is a moving field all the time, and we must be aware of that. Now, antimicrobial agents, just to uh, be absolutely uh, clear, it's a chemical agent, but not always chemical, as you've heard already, and we'll talk about that at the end, capable of killing a microorganism or inhibiting its development. Antimicrobial agents are often used very, very poorly by clinicians, and this is probably the most significant cause of the evolution of antimicrobial resistance. Now, the first antibiotic to be discovered was penicillin, and I will tell you about that in, in just a moment. And now we are running out of new antibiotic classes. Uh, largely because of resistance and largely because of lack of research. Now, antimicrobial drugs, and we'll be talking about those in a moment, they're characterized by their mechanism of action, cell wall, uh, translation, um, uh, 
E-flat pumps and so on. The molecular structure, beta-lactams like penicillin, and the spectrum of antimicrobial activity, gram-negative, gram-positive. Now the discovery of penicillin, I'm sure you all know, but it, it, it is quite a, a remarkable story that those of us involved in research would love to say we had this bit of serendipity. Alexander Fleming was a really quite boring Scottish microbiologist. <laughs> he worked in St. Mary's Hospital in London, went on holiday, and he left a Petri dish without the lid on for two weeks with an open window. And when he came back from his holiday, he found this, that on the plate which had Staph aureus, around a penicillin mold colony which had come in through the window, there was the lysis of these organisms. Now many of us in this room would have thrown that plate straight away in the, in the rubbish bin and said, ah, you're stupid, mm -hmm. uh, you left it out. Uh, he didn't. He scraped off the agar around here and put it on top of a different petri dish and showed he could transfer this killing. And this is true serendipity, but uh, he could have thrown it in the bin. Imagine what would have happened if he'd thrown that in the bin. Then he, he progressed and with Florian Chain, who started to develop synthesis of, of penicillin, uh, they were all given the Nobel Prize in medicine in 1945. So we're not talking of a, a, a long time ago for the first of the antimicrobial agents. Now, I mentioned earlier on modes of action, and, and we now know a great deal about the sites of action in bacteria. And you'll be hearing uh, later on today the detail of this biochemistry. But I wanted to show you this to say there are many different sites in the bacterium where antibiotics can work. So, for example, the penicillins work on this cell wall which is keeping the bacterial shape intact. It's like those plastic bags you buy oranges in, in the supermarket. It holds in, uh, but it holds it all together. If this is damaged, as it is by the penicillins, and you'll hear about this in the cell wall synthesis, the bacteria quite simply forms big blebs and dies. But there are many other areas of mode of action. Trimethoprim and sulfonamides, these actually were the very first antibiotics from the German drug industry. Dogmark uh, invent, uh, was using a dye called Prontosil rubrum, and this would kill bacteria. And it was shown that this works on uh, dihydrofolate reductase to produce uh, uh, purines for DNA. The more modern antibiotics have been working on ribosomes. Now, the ribosome, as you know, has two subunits, a 30 uh, Svedberg and 50 Svedberg unit, and the mRNA goes along the gap between the two. The last of the major groups of antibiotics, called linazolid, was shown to work on the ribosomal complex here to inhibit the translation of bacterial proteins. And everybody thought, great, this is going to work. And it did for about two years. Mm -hmm. And then resistance happened. And when the resistance was looked at in, in, in biochemical terms, show that linazolid bound to one of the ribosomal RNA proteins and you needed six mutations in that, uh, in that RNA uh, before you got full resistance and it took just two years for that to happen. Now when I was a medical student I was taught bacteria produce enzymes to enable them to 
become resistant to a particular antibiotic. As if bacteria had a brain and they thought, ah, penicillin, I've got to eat this up. Forget that. No brains, greatest microbes, they mutate and they acquire genetic <coughs> information to become resistant, as I'll show you. So a lot is now known about the, the site of mode of action of these antibiotics, and, and you'll hear about this later on today. Practically all of these antibiotics have resistant profiles in different organisms, and this is the challenge that we are now facing. Now, so how do bacteria gain antimicrobial resistance? No brains, machines, how do they do it? Well, they do it quite simply by either mutating or gaining new DNA which has got within it the sequence for resistance. And that can be resistance at the uh, RNA level, it can be at the cell wall synthesis level. But that's how they do it. Most bacteria, but not all, can reproduce within the space of about 90 to 120 minutes. So they're rapidly turning over. And I'll show you in a moment how the uh, con conjugation or sex between bacteria can actually transfer resistance factors. We now know that resistance works at all of these levels. Efflux pumps. These were very topical about 10 years ago when it was shown that there were some membrane pumps which would get rid of, anti uh, of antibiotics very quickly from the cytosol of the, uh, of the uh, organism. Again, this wasn't the, orga the organism being very clever and saying, I'm going to kick you out. It just happened that there was a pump in the membrane which did this by chance. mRNA and the ribosome, I mentioned to you, linazolid, and six mutations being required to, uh, uh, to acquire resistance to that drug. We'll be talking later on about beta-lactamylases, the enzyme that destroys penicillin. And again, the bacteria didn't think about producing this. It had an enzyme which, by chance, hydrolyzed uh, beta-lactams. And then it could exploit this uh, by uh, becoming resistant. Now, I mentioned to you already uh, the conjugation that bacteria have. And this is the schematic slide, and I'll show you some remarkable detail that is now available for this. Bacteria have an appendage called a pillus. And the pillus, uh, <coughs> when by chance it comes into contact with another microorganism, fuses with that membrane and forms what's called a conjugation bridge. And through this conjugation bridge, uh, a small piece of DNA can be transported. And this DNA, of course, is called a plasmid. It's a small piece, so it's relatively easy to package and then transport. And the enzymes which are responsible for uh, many of the, um, uh, of the resistance mechanisms are encoded on plasmids. So this mechanism is actually highly active. So you have a machine which can divide within two or three hours. It has sex, so it can transmit uh, its nucleic acid, and then it can divide again with the new nu nucleic acid, which will be uh, translated. You couldn't design a better bomb if you tried. Now, the actual mechanism of bacterial conjugation, some, some molecular biologists think uh, or say that this actually was the real beginning of molecular biology. It, it, the, and plasmids were at the centre of this. And you could work with plasmids because they were small bits of, of DNA. 
and the structure of the pillars and exactly how it, <coughs> it worked was, the, uh, was a great source of attention. And there's a wonderful review of this in the Embo Journal uh, by Jonathan Waxon at Birkbeck College in, in the UK. And he, he is a real scholar, this man. And if you can find this uh, reference, I strongly recommend it. And this is one of the diagrams that he had in, in his paper. In this paper. And this is the pillars. It has anchoring proteins within the cell membrane. Very common way of anchoring membrane proteins, of course, even in mammalian cells. And then it has a repeat and of these proteins here, which are arranged in a helical array. Now, to transport DNA, even in the plasma form, requires energy. And you would think there would be energy pumps in there, using ATP, of course, and maybe myosin motors, that would transport the, uh, the plasmid up. In fact, it's much simpler than that. So they think that the plasmid becomes assembled in some way inside the bacterium. It's folded, and then because of this helical array of proteins in the pillars, it twists up the pillars by covalent bonding, and then pops out the other end. But the other end, because of the B5, is already attached in the conjugation bridge. So when it falls out at the end, it's in the new bacterium. Absolutely simple, beautiful mechanism for, for doing this. So Jonathan Waxman in the Embo magazine uh, uh, journal, I strongly recommend to you. So greatest microbes, machines, no brain, uh, they just do it. Uh, and this is the challenge that we have. Now, it would be remiss of me not to mention antivirals because this, in terms of therapy, has been one of the greatest advances in, uh, in therapeutics, in my view. And I'm talking of HIV. And I was a, a young consultant physician when HIV started. And we had no treatment whatsoever. It, it was ghastly. And within the space of 15, 20 years, there were new drugs attacking different sites in the cycle of HIV. Now, HIV and TB are, are my actual, and the macrophage are my actual research areas, and I hope I'm going to be invited to tell you about that at, at the same time. But HIV gets into the cell, a macrophage or a lymphocyte, and the receptors for this are very, very well known. CD4 is one, but CCR5, which is a chemo receptor, was identified purely because there were groups of patients who had HIV virus around, but they didn't get disease. And the question was, why didn't they get disease or progress? And the answer was, they didn't have this second receptor, CCR5, which we now know is needed to be a molecule uh, to get the virus inside the cell and then hijack the cell's protein synthetic material and then to be packaged and assembled and leave the cell. And all of these points now are sites of inhibitors of HIV. And those of you who are used to treating HIV will know that combination therapy addressing three of these sites has now revolutionised the clinical course of, of HIV. So a beautiful example of how basic science has, has really altered the face of a, of a terrible disease. Now just to start to finish, why is antimicrobial resistance a, a profound health issue? Well, you, you've seen some of that or, or already in the introductory talk. Um, the main problem, we believe, is the poor governance of antibiotic use that's happened over the years, and I'll show you some more evidence of that. 
And also, there's growing attention now at the use of antimicrobial agents in agriculture. Now, just to give you an idea of the time scale of the acquisition of antimicrobial resistance. You'll see here the date of the antibiotic discovery, starting in 1920 with penicillin, and then the time before antibiotic resistance was first recognised. And you'll see, in fact it was recognised earlier than 1943, but it became a clinical problem in 1943. And similarly, all these common antibiotics, tetracycline, erythromycin, gentamicin, vancomycin, had resistance which emerged really pretty quickly after uh, the, uh, the, the clinical use of these drugs. And even the, the newer uh, drugs, the newer kephalosporins uh, and the gyrase inhibitors, uh, now have really a high resistance profile. And I've mentioned to you already linozolid and the six mutations required to produce TB. TB, a worldwide problem. And we now see MDR, multiple drug resistant TB. TB is one of those uh, infections, as you know, that you need at least three agents to treat and cure the disease. Multiple drug resistance uh, started to emerge, uh, as you see here, around about 2008. And rifampicin was an antibiotic which was the main uh, agent that we thought was killing the TB within the cell. And you can see that in the space of six years, resistance emerged in, in this way. And we now have even higher uh, levels of, of resistance for TB, which is becoming a real a plague. A drug like linazolid that I mentioned to you, by chance, was shown to work against TB, quite by chance. And, and that now is beginning to get resistance in tuberculosis. Now, on an international level, uh, antimicrobial resistance is now recognised as a global health issue and a threat to modern healthcare. And you've already seen this slide, which shows the, uh, the predicted deaths uh, attributable to antimicrobial resistance by 2050. Now what you can see here is that Asia, and I'll mention something about the use of agricultural antibiotics in Asia in a moment, and Africa are absolutely rampant in the deaths that we predict will be caused by uh, antimicrobial resistance. Europe is here, North America, round about the same as Europe. But these AMR resistance uh, patterns uh, are causing great healthcare costs, great human costs to, uh, to life. And it's now regarded as a health emergency. Now, one of the interesting things about antimicrobial agents is if you give them to animals, they gain weight and protein quicker and more efficiently than if you don't give them. Now this is because the antimicrobials damp down a low level of what's called the acute phase response. It's one of the host responses to low level inflammation. And so if you give antibiotics in the feed, you will make the cattle grow quicker, you can make more money. In China, uh, and I haven't got the video uh, to show you, uh, there's a video of Chinese pig farmers pouring sackfuls of a, a, a very, very important antibiotic called colistin into feed. And this colistin is not pure like the human, and the human uh, drug would be. It's crude, it's early from the industry, and they just pour it into the feed. Colistin is the last antibiotic for some infections like Acinetobacter. Now, it is not yet proved that this is causing a resistance, but it's very easy to anecdotally say this must be 
important. And there are big studies going on at the moment in, in Cambridge, uh, in the UK, looking at the agricultural use of antibiotics and uh, the resistance profile of patients admitted to the hospital. In the UK, the farmers have been very good and they've reduced the use of uh, antibiotics except for cases when an animal is ill. Uh, and uh, salmonella was very important in chickens uh, and all of the baby chicks are now injected with a vaccine uh, to, uh, uh, to prevent uh, that so they don't need antibiotics. The economic significance you've seen already, it's huge. It's huge, and, and as you heard beautifully in the first uh, few slides, uh, this is equivalent to a financial crisis, uh, and really is, is, is a major, major financial thing, let alone the human and the emotional aspects. This is a complex slide, and I would never usually slow, show a slide like this, but it shows that there are many factors we believe are responsible for antimicrobial resistance. But the major one is the injudicious, that is the false use of antibiotics. And one of the ways around that, which I am very passionate about, is, is rapid diagnosis and how you make a diagnosis quickly to say something is a bacterial disease rather than a viral disease, particularly in sore throats. This shows uh, that into, if you look down the vertical axis here, you see the name of the antibiotic, and you see the use of that antibiotic until 2000, and then the use of the antibiotic after 2000. And the use of broad spectrum penicillins, you can see, has dropped very considerably, whereas cephalosporins have increased, macrolides have decreased. <coughs> but if you look at these ones here, these are hardly being used. And the reason is there's serious resistance profile. So what is needed? Well, we have already heard about phages. When I was a medical student, I was told a million years ago the Russians were using phages in therapy, but nobody believed it. In the last two weeks, there have been a paper that we've heard about already from uh, Brussels, from St. Luke, which is remarkable, and one from London of uh, a, a, trans, a, a transplant patient, again, who got uh, a mycobacterial uh, infection. And this with phagolysis, uh, through genetic engineered phages, has controlled this disease. So we are really, really hoping that this is going to be a, a way forward. A lot of biotech companies are doing this. Rapid diagnosis is important, as I mentioned to you, and a strong, coordinated international effort to reduce the use of antibiotics in the wrong place is clearly very, very important. So I'll finish there, except just to remind you, the greatest microbes, the machines, they have no brains, they have sex, they reproduce very quickly, and they transfer their resistance. So if you learn nothing else from my talk today, I hope you remember the greatest microbes. I would call them the most wicked microbes rather than the greatest microbes. Thank you. Thank you all very much, Professor Griffin, for this great lecture, setting the stage for this timely problem. Questions or comments on this lecture? We hear a lot of in Belgium because we are one of the major vaccine providers uh, in the country, so she is there, yes. that one should work much more on trying to find vaccines for many of these bacteria, which is something that has never been tried actually, and that then this might be an important complement to possibly new strategies to. Uh, microbes, well, these bacteria with uh, drugs. Uh, absolutely. The, the simple ones, of course, are ones where you have a toxin used like tetanus, which has been used for many years. There's a vaccine which should be out quite soon, 
against C. difficile um, enterotoxin, uh, which could be very useful in the age of population that gets antibiotics. Uh, but you, you're absolutely right uh, to look at pseudomonas, and there have been attempts to make pseudomonas vaccines for patients with pneumonas, of course, that can get a high, high problem. But it, phages and vaccines are the big, big thing at the moment. The other thing, which is quite remarkable in my view, is even with the advent of powerful microbiology, there is still a search going on for new antibiotics from natural sources. And there's a, a big, big group in the University of Newcastle in England, and they are drenching the ocean, the deep, deepest bits of ocean, uh, to get these uh, organisms which are producing antimicrobial agents. So we haven't really advanced much from uh, Sir Alexander. <laughs> we, still, we still do that. To make a rational design chemically, and we will be hearing about that soon from Jean-Marie, uh, is, is really quite a difficult thing. Oh, a very difficult thing. If I, if I may add something about this, uh, natural producers, uh, we have a group in, in Yale who is uh, extremely interested in whatever you can get from streptomyces. Mm. And it seems that streptomyces is a, a source, a potential source of many, many compounds which are not expressed mm. in, in the bacterium uh, as it lives, in, in, at least in the laboratory. Mm. Mm. Well, you can see why biologically, if a fungus or, or an organism uh, like uh, actinomyces or, or streptomyces wants to survive and by chance it produces an enzyme or a compound which kills its competitors, it will do very well. So we are harnessing that bit of biology to try and find natural compounds. Of course then the chemistry is crucial because you isolate, you show the chemistry and then you can alter the, 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 the molecular structure to make it more soluble, less uh, toxic and so on. But natural sources are still the biggest way of finding new antibiotics. One last question. Well, thank you very much for this brilliant talk. Now, probably you have heard of a recent discovery at the University of Yerzyga Institute from a new antibiotic, very important, and it is quite strange, it is an antifungotic agent, you so I missed your last. Halo. No, I don't know that actually. No, no. It is yes. a It is a very, very potent antibiotic. Yes. You, is its mode of action known? No, no. It, it is just the observation. Yeah. At the beginning, it is a cardiologist who investigated or who surveyed two great clinical studies, and he showed that in these studies the patients under Ticagrilo were much more resistant and do not make severe infections like in uh, So it's, it's why we work and it must, the mechanism of action is not known and probably it is a new class of mm -hmm. antibiotics. Thank you for that. I mean one of the problems is if you have an infection and you give an antibiotic to which this, the bacterium is resistant, you, you kill off any organisms that are sensitive and you allow the resistant one to really grow fast. And simple organisms like pneumococcus uh, are now getting resistant to penicillin. So the, the British Pediatric Association now for children who they think might have pneumococcal meningitis do not use penicillin anymore. They use vancomycin as the, as the drug of choice because there's a probably as high as 10% resistance in, a, in an infection would kill the child. I think that's a good place to stop. Thank you yeah. so much, Professor Griffin. We know we have a very, you have a very tight schedule today, so it would not be possible for you to have your apologize for the whole morning. Thank you very much. It's, it's, a, great, it's a great honor to be here. Thank you.